the canter, though, is not from here. I don't intend to, again, deprecate those people who aren't here, except that sometimes, if you're not from here, there are some things, there are some nuances, there are some shades, particularly in dialect, that you're going to miss. That you're going to miss. And McKinley Cantor, as good as he is, misses some of those things. There are, there are various other attempts, some of, them, some of them better than others, but none of them, except with that first exception that I know of, that's really first rate. Another one. And I think that it's incumbent upon a, on us uh, to interpret as well as we can. This is one of, the, one of the great things that Vance Randolph has done, and that is he has, though he hasn't written the original, he has recorded much that is authentic. Vance Randolph recognizes his limitations, and that is that he, he was not from here, and he misses some things. My own... Um, deepest criticism of Mr. Randolph's work is that I don't believe that he puts uh, the role of the church in it quite its proper perspective in his works. And that is the people, and that's again not to dismiss or, or, or belittle what he did, because he has, he has the other side of the coin really well. But the, the matter of dialect, which I find uh, awfully interesting in a peripheral way is one of the things that has kept us from, well, which has allowed us to be thought of as buffoons. Uh, we all know that we seek out that which is quaint, that which is different, and if we're not careful, we'll laugh about it, and in so laughing at it, uh, diminish the person who, who says it that way. As a result, as I said near the beginning, a great many uh, students particularly are made to feel that their father and their mother and their grandparents don't speak correctly. And they, as quickly as they can, try to speak the way someone does on radio or on TV or at Springfield, as though Springfield is some kind of uh, oasis of uh, uh, pronunciation or anything else. But... Uh, I think that's really too bad. One of the worst things that a student can do is to go home and correct his mother or his father in pronunciation. Now, of course, if a, if a mother or a father asks the child, what about this or what about that, then that's something else. But simply going home and, and, and trying to shape up mom's or dad's pronunciation is something else. It's all finally a matter of communication. We know that anyone back in the hills here can, communi com can communicate with another person from back in the hills quite well. There's no, there's no problem whatsoever. I know this is almost altogether anecdotal, and I know that it has very little to do with the kind of real substance that Dr. Bynum might be able to talk about in terms of dialect, but I just wanted to talk generally about this. Everybody takes those pictures with a grain of salt. 
job. I've kept my husband by his accent and some of the things he uh, how he talks sometimes. Uh, at this point, <laughs> and, and when he uh, was in uh, the university, I know many of his fraternity brothers uh, did the same thing. But you know, I think it's too bad. In, in our day, everybody seems to want everybody to be the same. The Negroes have no individuality. They want to be like everybody else, don't they? Uh, I think it's too bad uh, that they don't preserve some of their folklore. Uh, I remember my mother talking about her a brother of hers who uh, was the end man on a minstrel show. You don't see minstrel shows anymore. Anybody who, who blackens his face, uh, that, that's bad. That's insulting. I don't think it is. I think it's great. I think it's fun. Um, because it's not done um, to, to make fun of the Negro. Uh, the other day, somebody was telling a Polish joke. And I said to my husband, I said, you know, I'm going to say a few more things. See, we have a different crowd here. I'm a native from the way back. And Wayne is too. And I know all of his, I never met him until today. I haven't met him yet. But I know all of his in-laws. And, uh, and it's just that we have different types of people here, you know, from Illinois, say. And then we're from the old part. And I knew this, but hit people different ways, but you're nice people, so why do we know it? <laughs> <laughs> we need one. I've been a native in this part of the country a whole lot longer than you have. I went to when I went to the University of Missouri in 1919, there were two people on campus who were not only hobbyists, but experts on dialect. One of them was Dr. Ramsey, and the other one was the gentleman who started the School of Journalism at the School of Missouri, Dean Walter Williams. And I had the opportunity of having classes and going to Sunday school classes that these two men taught. They never made any fun. Now I'll tell you what has made fun of the of the Ozark dialect. And it isn't your fault and it isn't my fault, but it is primarily the fault, hold your hats, of the country western music that came in with the Ozark Jubilee. And these people came in with this with these guitars. This is all right, but this was not authentic backwoods music. And you know that, and I know this. And the boys that came in and made a little money up here on the radio, and when they got through, they didn't have enough, what do they say, that, to buy beer. Uh, Red Foley, who came in from Tennessee, and these people, these people overturned the Elizabethan background of the people in this part of the country of which we should be proud. I was I grew up in in Lawrence County, which isn't very far away. And I'm not, don't think we need to have any feeling ethnic feeling at all. Irish jokes, black jokes, whatever they're they are. But we do need to keep our own heritage, but it isn't because of people who are different, it's people who were money makers and money grabbers. Now I'll get what my juice is for that. I think we should preserve our fascination with our, uh, with our bizarre history, and that includes, of course, uh, speech and music. But I don't think we should deny history. Now, we may want to improve our speech, but we shouldn't deny that this is the way we talk. I remember a few years ago when the black people uh, organized a protest against the Old Man River. Surely anybody thinks that Old Man River is one of our best folk pieces. I'm no musician, but I just can't see how you could fail to appreciate that. And they were protesting because they had the character at that time who was in Rob Rosen, and he had left the country, I think, wasn't about communists, but he had protested because the character singing had said, tired of living and scared to die. Well, 
I don't know why that would be offensive to anybody. That's what they said back in the Civil War time. They did say scary. Uh, and I don't think it would do you any good to deny that. Maybe you want to train them to say scared, all right. But let's not deny our history just because we'd like for it to be changed now. Okay. <laughs> Sonder Raps, the Star School is under wraps down here in the campus by the mill. Mr. Edwards is promoting Americana on the campus of the mill. And this little school, the Star School, and down on Flat Creek is a part of it. It's under wraps down here. At least three Thomases have taught there since 1910. Now I'm going to the hillbilly again. In Ireland, the tourist buys Pat a drink of Irish whiskey. It's very small. The tourist says, bring it up, Pat. It's 10 years old. And Pat says, it's mighty small for its age. <laughs> then, then we go to Scotland, and Donald is up there working when the tourists come along, the English tourists. And the tourist says, Donald, you should come down to London in winter time and see the sights. Donald said, nay, nay, the Sykes are come up here to see us in the summertime. <laughs> so uh, as far as these Ozark Hills goes, I find, found a hard one in them. I buried my dad here, and I hope to stay here and maybe grow flowers someday. But I will tell a story that I think you'll enjoy. It is Barry County and Kansas. Times were very difficult at Roaring River. And a uh, family living there decided, on hearing how good things were in Kansas, that they would go to Kansas. They went to Kansas, and uh, things were worse there. Their cattle died, drought hit them, everything went wrong. And one day he came home to dinner. It looked like everything was down the, down the creek. Uh, he said, Martha, They've taken everything from us but the love of God, and damn them, they can't take that from us. <laughs> now, this story was told by a wonderful man. He was born in Kentucky and came to Hawaii, to Barry County. He read law in Jake Davis's office, and some of you Barry County people who I'm talking about. He became a very well-read lawyer. He never was much of a speaker. He went to the dawning about a year ago. His name was Horace Gardner. Horace told that story that I've just told. So me, I don't, they can't hear they don't really. They can't even read the bushwhack about them. It's a darn good thing they can't. <laughs> so I've said my piece, but I would like the speaker to know that uh, Dr. Don Sater of SMSU gave this school, this little star school, to the School of the Ozark. And Dr. Clark's plan is that it will again be a school that appeals to me very much. And uh, we hope, with Mr. Edwards' plan and his generosity, that we will see a little school there carrying out Dr. Clark's idea that it will again be a school. Now, in passing, uh, one of the best memories of my youth is my teacher. Uh, in the school in Ireland, Robert Richardson, did more for me as a man and fathered me as a boy after my father died. And I'd like to quote Robert Richardson here after about 60, well, nearly 70, well, over 60 years. Before the class, so the class in the so National School, he would stand up and say, Around swings the hammer of industry, quickly the sharp chisel rings, the heart of a toiler has throbbings that stir not the bosom of teams. I think with the gals worthy that teaching is the highest profession. Uh, I haven't admired all teachers.
teachers that I've known. Uh, I don't think that if even their name had been Camellial, I could have sat very long with their feet. I'd have probably done a job of Mitch. But I do believe, and I expressed it a short time ago to a black girl at the Friendship House. She said she was going to be a lawyer, and I said, oh, I wish you'd choose to be a teacher. I think I've said enough. I've given you the two stories. <laughs> I have two or three announcements that I just must make. First of all, Paul Moyer, Moser in Springfield, has written a series of booklets on names of villages and towns. And he tells me that he gave me at one of these uh, the manuscript for one on Stone County. And, I, and asked me to pass it on to somebody in Stone County to review. And they never has got it back. Did anybody here get that? Do you know anybody I'd be likely to give it to? I do. Some, he said, give it to I some. Huh? I do. You do? Yeah. Well, afterwards, you tell me then. Why hasn't the magazine had Why hasn't the Well, I don't magazine? know. I, I just really if have only a foggy notion. Now, we I have all. We have all of his booklets at the library, several copies, and that one on Stone County. He said he he brought it and said pass it to somebody who knew something about it. So I'll anyway, I'll be who can help you try to run it down. All right. Now, um, last meeting, I asked if anyone had any information on the one-eyed court. Some woman out in California said they had written, said she had written to the um, Historical Society of Missouri for information on these three judges, each of whom had impaired vision in one eye, and they called it the one-eyed court, and that they had set up there to write down here and get the information from, from this organization. Well, I asked you last time if any of you had heard of it, if you had, to give me any information you had. I passed that on, I believe, to Mrs. Wills. And so, but I haven't had any, have you had? Well, if any of you know anything about it, uh, the man was supposed to have died in Christian County, and there were three judges, and they all had something out of one eye, so they called it the, the one-eyed court. Um, now, Vance and Mary Randolph, I have just been informed, are in a rest home down in Fayette, Arkansas. Their health uh, made it impractical for them to continue to live at Sunrise Manor. I think they had an apartment there. So they're in this nursing home. They at Arkansas. Vance. Huh? They're living in Sunrise Manor. Oh, all right, in Fayette. That's a nursing. Yes, it's a nursing. Bad Bell. Uh-huh. Bad Bell. And said they were were very much in need of companionship. So any of you who want to write them, write them. Or drop in to visit them, I imagine. Um then uh, another thing is that this organization I think should plan something in observance of the uh, bicentennial. And so, to, in preparation for that, I have appointed a committee with Douglas Mandy as chairman, and Elmo Engelton, who is our historian, and Sunita Brown, a past president, to gather some ideas and present them to the organization at the next meeting. And then, in the meantime, all the rest of you be thinking of what we could do to give some good uh, program or to add something to the celebration. If you want to write one of them, you can write Mr. Mandy, or you can send it to them or to me, and we'll bring it up and discuss it and talk on it next time when we have a little more time. Um, our next meeting will be on June the 15th, and we'll be here, and we'll have to let you know, I assume, that it will be in the case the new cafeteria, which would be nice. But anyway, we'll let you know before that uh, where it's to be. Um, and this time, uh, we're, we're going to do one that's kind of been in my mind all my life. I only have one domestic accomplishment in the whole world. Well, I have two. I can wash dishes. And the other is I can cook, and I'd like to. And so I wanted to do a, a series on foods in the open. And I think it would be interesting, and I know some interesting people that contrib contribute to it. And I have some, own, some of my own stuff that's been published on that. And so we are, are going to make that. Uh, do any of you know Bertha, Bertha Daniels? 
her father was um, I think it gave me her address. Well, anyway, she has this uh, subject that uh, she's, they tell me is very interesting, and I'm going to get in touch with her. She's in a way now, I called her sister, but I'm just sure we can get her. So our next subject will be on, what did she call hers? Gastronomical. Um, <laughs> well, we're going to talk about foods of this area next time, I think. That will be my last program. Um, uh, it's, it's right that it should be one that's close to my heart, my stomach. <laughs> so, uh, yes, does anybody have any any other announcements? I don't have an announcement. I, I think I'm entitled to equal rights with Mr. Taylor in his speech, and, you know, the equal rights with the popular thing today. I want to tell you how she became an authority on the Ozarks. I went through grade school here in Branson and high school in Springfield, born in Springfield, and then spent 45 years in Chicago. And the idea of a Chicago girl, and, uh, I came through until I caught her, and we've been together since more than 40 years. Uh, first, when we were first married, I brought Jackie to Branson. We lived on, my folks lived on a little farm just west of uh, Skaggs Hospital about that, and I'm in Laura Creek Valley. Just a little three-room house, and I had a kitchen and one bedroom and a living room, but had a nice sleeping porch on the front, screen, partially screened in, or screened in. It was on the east side of the house, so naturally, during the summer when we were taking vacations, the sun, sunlight wake up quite early, and one morning Jackie left me, and she was a city girl, remember, and hadn't heard all these country sounds. She heard the birds beginning to chirp and the roosters crowing and the cows were blowing and dogs beginning to bark and she recited each of these and said, oh listen, hear that noise, hear that noise. And I said, yes, and there's one noise you've missed, do you hear the cowbell? Oh yes, who's ringing? <laughs> uh, thank you. But ask them to come pay, ask them to come pay their dues to the White River Valley Historical Society before they leave. That's much more important. All right, you all hear that. And then our next meeting, the subject at our next meeting, I have
it is his legacy of achievement that he has left to us, of his friendship and goodwill that he has showed. If we all can remember, as he so wonderfully demonstrated, the cheering value of a friendly smile, the uh, inspiration of worthy leadership, then this will become the kind of world that we would like to have it be. In memory of Colonel Cummings, let's aspire to a happy relationship with our fellow men and a goal of greater service. And Ms. Mrs. Sunita Brown, who is past president of this organization, knew Al for a long, long time, I'm sure. I didn't know I was going to speak until I got here, so I don't have a well-prepared speech like Lucille does. But if you knew Al Cummings, you loved him. I met him first at, S at uh, Springfield, at SMS many years ago in the speech department and he was a student there and there was a teacher in the speech department that I admired very much and that Al admired very much and I identified Al with the speech department there and I liked him there and then when I started coming to historical society meetings and all the years that I've been coming you know Al missed last June meeting he was in Hawaii in June and he wasn't here in June now that's the only meeting that I can remember in many years that Al hasn't been sitting over here. So for all of us today, there's, there's a big vacant place over here. There's one that won't be filled. And as I heard all you people say, I'm retired. I thought, as you were saying this, of so many things that Al told me, when I retire, I'm going to do that. You know, when I retire, I want to see the Historical Society do this. I want to see us accomplish this when I retire. Well, Al's retired now, finally. But he won't do the things that he wanted to do for the Historical Society. Now, your charge and my charge, your job and my job is greater today because we've got to do these things that Al Cummings said. These are the things we're going to do. That's our job. Let's do it for Al. As I say, I know there I know there are many here who could speak feelingly of Al and his friendship and express our appreciation and affection for him. Uh, but we will hold it, I suppose, Judge, a few. But I would like to ask uh, Mr. Douglas Manning to comment about Friends of the Society, <clears throat> you all know the fine work that Al did for us. It would take a long time for all of us to enumerate things that he did, getting out the notices, making the reservations for us, looking after the speaking system, and getting the program arranged for us, all those fine things that he did. He must have had for his motto the words of the French philosopher who said, I shall pass through this world but once. Therefore, any good I may do, or any kindness I may show a fellow creature, let me do it now. And then when I think about my personal life, how much Al meant to me and Dorothy. Uh, what I, I had, uh, the little book I had published, Al's what encouraged me to do that along with Lucille. And then when I pecked away on the typewriter and got it ready, the first manuscript, Dorothy retyped it and proofed it for me. So they were interested, I reason I tell you that little personal experience, they were interested in trying to get the history and the stories of our area recorded. Now the place of one is so wise and so helpful. Uh, it will be hard for us to feel. You know, I think it was best said by Edward Markham, who was speaking of Lincoln's passing, he said, he went down what, as when a lordly cedar green with the boughs goes down with a shout upon the hills and leaves the lonesome place against the sky. I think as the other speakers have said, that the best thing we can do for Al's memory is to dedicate ourselves in this association to preserving the legend and the history of this area that our forefathers settled so long ago. I mentioned that there would be a vacancy in the Secretary of Treasurer's position, 
and this the Wayne Davis of the New York Yards as Secretary Treasurer. And he's agreed to fill this place for the unexpired term of the of Al. But uh, of course, we're hoping we can persuade him to stay long. But anyway, for the moment, he is our Secretary Treasurer. He's the one you'll be sending your dues to. That Mrs. Bingham said you must send soon. And it would be a nice tribute to to Al if we would have a, a surge of memberships to build society. Um, uh, we've had a lot of folk material, music, stories. Um, we have, we've had some of Mr. Mankey's funny stories, which included a lot of dialect, but we haven't considered it serious. But we've run into more than one complication this time, as you know. Uh, we had a speaker from Drury College who was to, to talk to us on subject at Ozark Island, and night before last, he had to go to the hospital and couldn't make it. But he had um, another associate professor in the same department has very generously offered to fill in for Mr. Dr. Bynum. I am candid, and it's, it's awfully hard to not, generally not to talk about your own affairs when something comes up, but I was just telling, um, I was just speaking to this, I was just talking to the speaker about uh, going to New York once back in the 30s. I don't remember the right, and I don't remember the name of the man, but he'd been attracting a lot of attention over the country uh, by his ability to identify the origin of anyone he talked to just a few minutes. So I was with a bunch of newspaper people in New York, and, and I hadn't said two or three sentences when he said to me, it, it must be interesting living in the Ozarks. I said, well, yes it is, but I'm just interested to know how you could identify me so quickly. And he said, well, uh, in those days we traveled by train. And he said, you said right away that you were late because you had a washout on your train. He, he said, that's so typically Southwest Missouri and almost without doubt, Ozark Hills. And I'm sure that's where you came from, which of course I am. And I was just, I just said that I, uh, I still say wash. I still wash my clothes. And I think the reason I do is that it's just a form of, a form of defiance to the establishment. Did you ever encounter that? <laughs> well, I, I think it's good for us to consider our daily. I don't think we've got to get too far from it. It's part of our heritage, and I think we ought to treasure the good part of it. And I believe we're going to have a very generous speaker on that. Um, I remember one time, I always liked to use new words, but I never could spell, so I always mispronounced them. Spelling them incorrectly, I naturally would mispronounce them. So one day, though, and I was about, you know, I met you probably 13, I was writing a letter at my mother's desk. And it was a hot day, and I called her, and I said, can you tell me how to, tell me how to spell perspiration? And she was mopping around, she walked to the door where I was sitting. She said, well, let's ask that question again. And I said, well, I want to know how to spell perspiration. And she said, well, I'll tell you, young lady, I suggest that until you can do better than that, you say sweat. <laughs> well, from the, uh, from SMS, 
University in Springfield and had his master's degree from Missouri University. He taught, he taught in St. Louis at Webster Road High School, then went to Cotter College, and then came to Springfield and became associated with Drury College in 1966. And he's still on the faculty in the English department there. And he is going to talk to us about Ozark dialect. see this is going to be some trouble because a person has to really be pinned to it apparently. This whole business of sweating uh, reminds me of something that's uh, kind of a joke in my own family. I uh, come from, uh, from Barry County. I still live, uh, oh, about five miles from where I grew up. Uh, we came to Missouri Ozarks in 1934. We'd, uh, I was born in 1930 in Kansas. Some of you who remember conditions in northern Kansas or that area can well understand how people uh, migrated from one area to another. We went to southwestern uh, Oklahoma, and then uh, the next year came to, came to Missouri. I uh, spent a good deal of time in Berry County and Stone County as a sharecropper uh, along with my uh, uh, family, six children, and uh, mother and father. I married uh, into a family where, still a rather, rather a joke, private joke at that, but uh, uh, my wife belonged to the, to the Thomas family, and according to the Thomases, uh, good Thomas girls don't sweat. <laughs> well, uh, I think, uh, I think if you get them, get them just right, the Thomas girl will sweat just as well as anyone, anyone else. Perspiration notwithstanding. My expertise on, on dialect is very limited indeed. I'm going to give you some observations, and my observations are going to going to have to do with a larger topic. I'm more interested in, in folklore, I'm interested in historical societies. I'm interested I'm deeply interested in our heritage. I think that we've sold we've been sold down the river, and I think most of this is our own fault. One of, the, one of the things that bothers me the most is that we, uh, we are deeply ambivalent about who we are. We, uh, we can't decide. We're proud on one hand and we're deeply ashamed on the other. One of the reasons we are ashamed, and some of us, my own defensiveness, of course, gives mine away. But uh, one of the things that, uh, one of the reasons why we're so defensive is because the caricature of the hillbilly has been maintained so long. Uh, it's a curious uh, anomaly, as far as I'm concerned, and that is uh, the blacks uh, are way ahead of us in the respect that um, the, the caricature of the black man, the, the black man as, a, as an Uncle Tom or as a, as a buffoon, is no longer tolerated. It's, but curiously enough, we're still allowing or even encouraging uh, ourselves to be regarded as dolts, as buffoons. Part of this, a great deal of this, has to do with our language. We don't, uh, we don't realize, or perhaps we don't realize, that some of our language goes back as far as it, as it does. I didn't know, for example, until I was uh, in graduate school at the University of Missouri studying Shakespeare and Chaucer, I didn't know until then that much of what was natural to me and to my uh, uh, students, fellow students in one-room schoolhouses in Barry County could, went back as far as Shakespeare and, and Chaucer. I had, been, um, I had been reproved. I had been made to feel inadequate. I had been made to feel inferior for some constructions that, that had anywhere from three to 600-year uh, tradition behind them. Such words as you've all heard, and that is, I just as leave do this or that, or I just as leave, which is even even older uh, that we find in Chaucer, the L-I-E-F, uh, old and authentic uh, traditional words have been by and large uh, passed up, or or people have been made to feel uh, 
if not ashamed, they, they've been made to feel that they ought to take on other words. The, the same thing is true with some of our, our essentially I, iambic uh, constructions. When we say we're going to go a hunting, and we put the A in there, it's, a, it's, it's very traditional, long-standing that we do, that we construct sentences this way. But um, we as English teachers, by and large, and elementary teachers, who I might say, and this is a self-indictment as much as it is anything else, we as teachers are by and large a pretty insecure lot. And as we, as we try to, to better ourselves, one of the things that we do, or that we've learned, is that if we, can, if we can get rid of that which tags us, although as Mrs. Anderson pointed out, we can't really get rid of it. Anyone, anyone can tag us in a minute who knows anything about the language. But we, we, we fool ourselves into thinking that we can put ing's on our words or put, put uh, maybe a, an essentially eastern or northern or some other kind of inflection upon our words and pass as something that, which we are not. That's false. That's very false. But part of, the, part of this is because, as I've already indicated, the, the caricature of the hillbilly is uh, something that we're, uh, we're pretty much stuck with. It's understandable. It's understandable in terms of uh, what some of us know about in the 30s, what we went through with in the 30s, and, and, and some of the degradation done to us, whether it was in terms of, of lining up and, and taking uh, food uh, when we would much prefer uh, working for our food. Uh, this kind of degradation uh, necessarily allowed us or even encouraged us to um, perhaps um, pose as a different kind of hillbilly than what we really were. I think that it's too bad, and I don't know any way out of it. I don't know any way out of it at all. I think part of it, and this, this, this is uh, it's going to step on some toes. I think in terms of uh, dialect, um, Dale Freeman, the editor of the, of the Springfield newspaper, I think does a great disservice to us. A great disservice to us. And the reason I think that he does, I think Dale Freeman is a good editor. I think that he loves uh, the Ozarks, and I think he loves the people in the Ozarks. But his little book, How to Speak Ozark Ease and One Easy Lesson, um, is, um, is not true. It's not true. And the reason it's not true is because it packs too much that's authentic in its own right. Packs it up too much and makes it, uh, makes it humorous or apparently humorous. And as a result, we feel patronized and we feel condescended to. Now, I know that Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, well, a number of people, not simply Mr. Freeman himself, but in speaking of Mr. Freeman, um, other people have mentioned this to him, and he, he, uh, he, he thinks that this isn't so. I'm not uh, second-guessing what he, his feelings about the Ozarks or anything else. It's awfully difficult, though, to deal with dialect without, without bringing in that which is facetious or that which is humorous. Uh, for example, his use of the word crick. I find that very, very few people in, in the Missouri Ozarks, per se, say crick. Now, there are a few, a few places where, it, where some outside influence has caused that, that uh, pronunciation to be used. But most of us say creek. Um, Miss, Mr. Freeman uh, cites creek as, as authentic. I wouldn't even mind so much um, what he does if he, like lots of other people, if he didn't use the caricature of the buffoon. And that is, we've seen them all, and that is, with the, with the whiskers, with the, with the silly grin, with the inane expression. I believe that this uh, degrades all of us by extension, and I lament it. I think it's too bad, for example, that uh, year in and year out, I'll have students come in from various communities, whether it's Nixa or whether it's Hurley or where have you. Many of them uh, are unsure of themselves and are a little bit ashamed of their heritage, which I think they ought to be very proud of indeed. But one of the reasons they are is because we as school teachers have, have tried to insist that they speak proper English, whereas we don't know that perhaps
that which they speak automatically and authentically is more proper than what one might hear on, on TV or on radio or anyplace else. There are attendant or related um, problems, it seems to me, that are that, that is connected with this whole business of um, the ambivalence that we feel about who we are. Part of it has to do with um, even such an apparently innocuous subject as the weather on KY, KY3 TV every, uh, every night at 10 o'clock. Uh, as cleverly done as that is, I object to that. I object to that very much because the, the implicit suggestion is that we are buffoons. I don't think that we are buffoons, but as long as this caricature persists, people will believe it. Let me, let me stop a moment and cite a, a personal uh, <coughs> example. A few years ago, I was, I was extremely uh, interested in Shakespeare's Othello. I had been uh, working on a, on a topic in connection with it, an interpretation, and had uh, made a good deal of headway, and on the basis of my interpretation, had, admit, had been invited to, uh, to Connecticut for a, a summer institute on, on Shakespeare. At this institute, I was, I was uh, asked to, to talk to the members of the institute, some 60-odd members, for uh, several days on my, my, as it was, heretical interpretation of Shakespeare's Othello. Now, just in passing, sort of in passing and passing, um, let it be said that part of my interpretation of Othello was based upon what I had learned as a boy in the hills and in Berry County. That is, in terms of the language that I had heard and some of the customs that Shakespeare recounts in the work. But then, as I, as I was invited to address these members of, uh, of the Institute, most of them PhD candidates in, in Shakespeare, it took me about a week, it took me almost the whole time before I convinced them that I had uh, a viable interpretation or perhaps even an interpretation that was, that was uh, better than the one that they had been led to believe was all right for these uh, 300 some odd years since Shakespeare wrote the work. I was to deliver a paper in Milwaukee in the same year. This was in, in July in, in, in Connecticut. I was to deliver a paper on a fellow in Milwaukee, the Modern Language Association, on the same subject. But, but after I convinced most of the members of the group that I had um, a, a good and valid interpretation, three or four of the guys that I'd come to know well came to me in all good faith gave me some advice, and that is, they said, we think that between now and then, that is, October, July and October, when you're going to have about an hour to present essentially what you've taken a week to convince us to do, in order for you to get the, be the best out of the time, what you ought to do is spend as much time as possible getting rid of that hillbilly dialect. <coughs> I was insulted. I was insulted. The very idea that there is, a, there is positive correlation between how a person sounds and what's in his head. But I believe that most of us here in the hills, one way or another, at least tacitly, go under the assumption that simply because we speak a little more quaintly, if you want to use that word, I'd prefer something else, more purely, than, than people in other areas that we somehow are lacking in gray matter. And much, for example, uh, oh, the word, the word ain't. Now, of course, ain't isn't, isn't by any means simply uh, indigenous to, to, the, to the Ozarks. But I can remember in growing up, we could say ain't in a one-room school all we wished. We couldn't say ain't. We couldn't say ain't. Now, that's odd, isn't it? Uh, now, as a matter of fact, most of us today cannot say ain't. Some few free souls can, but most of us sort of quiver because the, the job of the school teacher has taken its toll. We can't say ain't. 
There are lots and lots of other words that, that are similarly, of, or of a similar nature, that are just automatic, or would be automatic, that we end up not being able to say. And as a matter of fact, then, we end up being hesitant, and we end up letting other people interpret our lives. And this is a slightly different um, tack that I, that I want to just talk on a few minutes. And that is, I deplore that most of us have, are letting other people interpret our lives. This is related to what, what I've said in terms of, of, the, of the dialect. One of the reasons, as a matter of fact, is because, as was intimated by one of the speakers, um, one of the reasons is because dialect is so difficult to, to handle. Vance Randolph, who as far as I'm concerned, is the best authority in folklore, certainly in the Ozarks, if not in the country, is right on it in his book, Down the Hall, when he talks about the difficulty of getting it down. When, as he in, in, in essentially reviews the various works, or the, or the works that had been written up to that time on dialect, he points out time after time of the difficulty of well-intentioned writers and authors of getting off and ending up making something look foolish. For example, writing writing from F R U M and and cause C U Z and a great many other things that end up uh, making the making it uh, look foolish. But it's difficult to do. It's extremely difficult to do. But by and large, we have let outsiders uh, interpret both our, our dialect and our lives. I don't know of a, of, of a single first-rate work of the area. Not a one. And of course, I know that that's heresy. I know that. I was, I was led to believe for a long, long time, particularly in that I went to, the, to a one-room school only, uh, oh, a, a short quarter of a mile from where Harold Bell Wright did a good deal of his writing. I was led to believe that Harold Bell Wright was a first-rate writer. I don't think that he is. I'm sorry to say that. I'm sorry to say that. That's like, that's like finally coming to, to, to say that, that a, that a well-loved uncle is in some way inadequate, in a way that we've, we've, we've held him up. I think we've held him up too much, and that isn't to, to, to deprecate some of the good things that he's done. Some of the things that he writes about are correct. Some of it is not. Some of it is modern, some of it is sentimental, and most of the of what I have read about the Ozarks lately or lends towards that which is modern, that which is sentimental. I'm by no means knocking that which is truly sentimental. Or that we're all, we're all romanticists, but that which cheapens that, that which is truly sentimental. Well, I think it's too bad, for example, that the word sentimental has come to have a pejorative effect. Uh, such a bad poet as uh, Edgar Guest, for example, is a, is a good reason for that. He has cheapened uh, some of the things that most of us hold dear. You can only write about mom and apple pie so much without, it, without having a cheapening effect. Well, the same thing has happened to that which is genuinely um, simple, that which, that which has to do with uh, the verities of nature, the verities uh, in, in, in the human relationship can be sentimentalized. And I'm afraid that most of the writers that I have read have sentimentalized the whole subject. I know of only one work, and that's a short story by the writer Robert Penn Warren, The Patented Gate and a Mean Hamburger, which, which really comes to terms with Though it isn't Ozark, the, the Ozark region per se, Robert Penn Warren says that it might be. It might very well be. The locale is East Tennessee. 
But those of you who know something about about the progression know that it very well could be East Tennessee very well could be uh, the, the Ozarks. But in his story, The Patent Gate and the Mean Hamburger, Robert Penn Warren, through the eyes of a of a one once once upon a time uh, Sheriff Cropper and his wife and his three kids, comes to terms with the fundamental problem that a man and a woman have in living together. And that is uh, showing that the dreams of a man and of a woman aren't necessarily the same. I don't by any means intend to, to be critical, but again and again, women are find themselves defined in terms of who their husband is or what their husband does. I think that's regrettable. I think that's regrettable. And it seems to me that uh, Robert Penn Warren is one of the few people who writes